world. And uh, if you have a Bible, uh, do, uh, do grab it and open it. If you haven't got one but would like one, there's plenty uh, in the entrance foyer. Do feel free to get up and grab one uh, if you want one. And if you're a child or a young person, you don't have the packs, then come and see Laura and she will give you one, uh, which will help you as we follow through Daniel 7 this morning. Uh, just a question, really, for you to ponder, which is on the screen uh, here. Uh, can you think of an example an example uh, of something that you need to be prepared for. Something that you need to be prepared for. And the second part of that question is, what would you do to prepare for it? H how would you be prepared? So what might you need to be prepared for? And what would you do in order to be prepared for it? Why don't you, for 30 seconds, just have a chat uh, to the person next to you, to your friend, to your mum, to your dad, whoever you're with, about that question. What do you need to be prepared for and what would you do to be prepared? Go. Okay, uh, just wrap up your conversation. Hopefully you've got a chance to share something. Uh, I'm sure we can all think of something uh, that we need to be prepared for, and uh, how we prepare for it depends on what it is. Uh, but we're going to think a little bit, and we're going to see this <clears throat> as uh, we look through Daniel 7, uh, about the need for us as Christians uh, to be prepared, uh, to be prepared uh, in uh, understanding of the days that we live in, uh, and to be prepared... Uh, in order to stand for the Lord uh, in uh, what uh, we've described several times as a hostile world. Uh, well, when we come to Daniel 7, which uh, helpfully Laura uh, shared much of earlier in, in the Bible bite, um, just a, a kind of a, a caveat, really, uh, as we come to it, it is Daniel 7 is a very dense text. It's very complicated, and it's very difficult um, to understand, and it's very difficult to wrestle with. And uh, we don't have time this morning to go into every uh, fine detail of Daniel 7. In fact, we probably could do a whole sermon series just on Daniel 7, just on any of these chapters that are left uh, in the book of Daniel, because they're difficult, and we could break them down, and we could uh, spend many, many uh, sermons uh, dwelling on uh, this text. So we're just going to think big picture this morning. Uh, what is uh, Daniel 7 uh, telling us? Let me just pray briefly before we get into this, because uh, with that in mind, it is a difficult text. We want to hear what the Lord has to say to us this morning. Father, thank you for your word, and uh, we just pray, Lord, now that we would not hear uh, my words, but your word, and Lord, that you would help us to hear, to listen, and that, Lord, in listening and hearing your voice, that we would see Jesus and that your name would be glorified, we pray. Holy Spirit, help us now. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm sure uh, we're all familiar, whether we're a child uh, or whether we're an adult, we're all familiar with that experience of a deja vu. Uh, a deja vu, that experience where uh, we're going about our lives, we're doing something, maybe at school or at work or at home, and then all of a sudden we get this feeling, don't we, that we've been here before, this has happened uh, before. It's kind of a weird experience. Uh, I guess something triggers kind of a memory, and uh, we feel like we're living uh, on repeat in some way. Uh, well, as we get to chapter 7 of Daniel, uh, there is a kind of a sense of deja vu. Uh, not completely, uh, but there's a strong parallel between Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2. Laura hinted at that earlier in the Bible. But in chapter 2, uh, you'll remember Nebuchadnezzar has this a dream of a statue, and uh, the, uh, the statue which has a head of gold, uh, a chest and arms of silver, belly of bronze, and feet partly of clay, partly of iron. This is the statue that Nebuchadnezzar sees. 
in Daniel 2. And we saw how that statue spoke of coming kingdoms. There was the Babylonian kingdom, the Persian kingdom, the Greek kingdom, and then uh, the Roman uh, kingdom. Well, here in chapter 7, the message is somewhat similar, uh, but expressed in a slightly different way. Uh, The way and the style in which it's communicated has evolved somewhat from Daniel chapter 2. Uh, In Daniel 2, in fact, in the first six chapters of uh, Daniel, uh, the the, the style of the text is what we would call narrative, it's story. It tells us about Daniel, what he got up to, and his friend Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, By chapter 7, the style has evolved somewhat, and for the rest of Daniel, chapters 7 through 12, uh, we have uh, what we would call apocalyptic uh, style of writing, just different styles of writing. We're familiar with that from our lives. If we read a newspaper, uh, that's a different style of writing to a menu, isn't it, in a restaurant. They're both writing, but different styles, different characteristics. Uh, That is true here in Daniel. So when we get to Daniel 7, uh, it's apocalyptic, which is a style of writing full of imagery and uh, pictures. Uh, This is how one commentator describes it. The sovereignty of God is going to be taught via sci-fi. Truth will be conveyed symbolically through wild, crazy, and strange uh, imagery. Or as another puts it, it is essentially a book of pictures appealing to our senses, and we're meant to be overwhelmed by this, as Daniel was. So when we read it, uh, we'll find a great deal of symbolism And there is that sense of being overwhelmed by it because we're not quite sure what to do with this, much like when we read uh, the book of Revelation. And there is a sense in which we're supposed to be overwhelmed by it and struck by it. Uh, But just a a brief warning as we come to it, we can, I think, if we're not careful, uh, fail to take uh, some of this literature in the Bible seriously because we hear it and we think this is crazy. It is like a sci-fi film. It is beyond our comprehension. uh, And therefore we could dismiss it as not real world stuff. This is fantasy or this is uh, fiction. But we would be foolish and blind to think like that because beneath the pictures and beneath the imagery and beneath the symbolism uh, is profound prophetic revelation for the future uh, of the world in which we live. And we'll be all the better for listening and preparing for the day's in which we live and the days into which the Lord leads us. Uh, And we're going to see here a strong reminder in uh, Daniel 7 of the truth that there is a strong opposition to the rule of God. There is a strong opposition to God's rule, opposition which is formidable and powerful. And whilst the opposition to God at times might even seem overwhelming, it might seem that the enemy is too strong, and will win. Nevertheless, uh, from Daniel 7, we're reminded that God is God, and that he alone is all-powerful, and his kingdom endures when others will fall. Well, let's turn to uh, to Daniel 7, and verses 1 to 8, which are called the vision of the creatures. The vision of the creatures. First one kind of sets the scene uh, for us. Uh, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. So we're kind of given a time frame as to when this took place. And we've actually jumped backwards in terms of the chronology of the book of Daniel. Uh, This uh, vision that Daniel has in chapter 7 probably happened between chapters 4 and 5. So if you're one of those people that likes to know the order of things, uh, this was happening between chapters 4 and 5 of the book. And the Lord starts to speak to Daniel in this profound way. Here's the Lord, the revealer of mysteries, speaking to his prophet, uh, Daniel. And at the start of this vision, and described in these opening eight verses, is these these creatures, four creatures, which do indeed seem like they have been extracted from uh, either a sci-fi movie or even a horror film. They're quite gruesome, uh, grotesque creatures uh, that we read of. But before we get to the creatures, we're told in verse 2 where these creatures arose from. 
Verse 2, Daniel looks and before him he sees four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. So the first thing to note is where these beasts emerge from. These crazy beasts that Laura described for us uh, earlier. Well, they emerge out of uh, the sea. They come up out of the sea. And this was a huge ocean uh, that Daniel's seeing in his vision. This is not just a little sea. This is a massive, uh, great ocean. And to the Hebrews, the sea uh, was both dangerous. It, it symbolized danger and mystery. And it also represented restlessness and ultimately evil. The sea represented evil. So these beasts arise from this sea, which symbolizes evil. We see that elsewhere in scripture, Isaiah 57. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, <clears throat> whose waves cast up mire and mud. Isaiah 17, woe to the many nations that rage. They rage like the raging sea. Woe to the peoples who roar. They roar like the roaring of great waters. And so the restless, evil waters produce these four monsters. And as we read of these four beasts, uh, we could almost glaze over again because of the bizarre descriptions uh, and the, the fact that they seem like they're from a movie and they're from sort of a fiction world. Um, but we're not supposed to glaze over. We're supposed to be struck uh, by the fearsome nature of these beasts which Daniel sees. And we're not supposed to jump to interpreting them straight away. We're not supposed to think, well, clearly that beast represents X, Y, or Z. Although there is that sense, of course, behind uh, the uh, symbolism of what they represent. Initially, we're just supposed to be struck by the gruesome nature of these beasts because they are incredibly gruesome. That's, that was Daniel's reaction. He was struck uh, by them. Well, what are these beasts? Well, we'll just move quickly through this because Laura described uh, them earlier for us in the Bible Bite. And uh, young people, if you've got the uh, question sheet, I think there's a section uh, on it to uh, write down in your own words uh, your description of these beasts. Well, we have in verse 4 the lion and the eagle, um, this kind of combo. Uh, that's the first uh, beast uh, suggesting a, a beast of dominion and a beast of strength. Uh, and just as the head of gold in chapter 2 represented the kingdom of Babylon, uh, so it's likely that this beast speaks of uh, the Babylonian uh, kingdom. Uh, we see in Jeremiah uh, chapter 4, uh, he uses a lion also to describe the Babylonian kingdom. So Jeremiah chapter 4, a lion has come out of his lair, a destroyer of nations has set out. He's left his place to lay waste your land. Your towns will lie in ruins without inhabitant. And similarly, Ezekiel speaks of uh, Babylon using this kind of lion imagery. Uh, the second beast that we read of is the bear. And uh, the, uh, this bear, which has ribs, uh, we're told, is holding ribs. Uh, and some commentators want to uh, suggest what these ribs might uh, represent specifically. Uh, I think Calvin's quite helpful. He just speaks of the insatiable nature of this beast. Here is a beast with an insatiable uh, appetite, ultimately, uh, for evil. The third beast is this leopard in verse 6 with uh, four heads and four wings. Again, it's getting more bizarre, isn't it? Here's a leopard with four heads and four wings, representing, speaking of the, uh, the Greek empire, and uh, the four heads uh, speaking, ultimately, of how that empire, that kingdom, did end up uh, dividing. So we've got these three beasts and then we get to this fourth beast. And the fourth beast, it's quite clear uh, from the text, is different. It's in a different league to these first three beasts. If it, in football in terms, the first three beasts are in the championship. This fourth beast is a Premier League beast. It, it, it's, it's a new level of beast. Verse 7, after that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening, and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts and it had 10 horns. This is a new level of power that we read about 
a new level of evil, a new level of fear to be caused by this fourth beast. Just note the destructive nature of this beast, the appetite to devour and the appetite uh, to destroy. And we also note from this beast, from verse 7 there, uh, that this beast has iron teeth. Now in chapter 2, when Nebuchadnezzar had his dream of this statue, uh, the iron uh, part of the statue, which uh, was the, uh, the feet, I believe, represented the, the coming empire of Rome, this anti-God empire that would rise up uh, in the years following uh, Daniel. We're also told here that this beast has iron teeth. So there's a clear parallel uh, between chapters 2 and chapters 7. And we're also told that this beast has 10 horns, representing its extraordinary strength. And verse 8 tells us that a further horn arises with eyes. Now, this is getting pretty weird now, isn't it? You're probably thinking this is a crazy vision. It's almost impossible to imagine, isn't it? Because we've never, ever experienced or seen uh, anything like this. And it is quite unusual, but we have to keep remembering the kind of literature that we're reading. And there is great truth uh, behind uh, this symbolism. We're not just to dismiss it as fiction. Uh, we want to hear and see what the Lord is saying to us through this. So be patient uh, as we work through this. So the horn uh, with eyes that is described here by Daniel, uh, perhaps speaking of a human ruler. Also, it has a mouth, we're told, speaking boastfully. So whatever this horn represents on this fourth beast. It's something of a human likeness. It has eyes and it has a mouth. Well, let's just sum up where we've got to in this. So we've been introduced to these four beasts and uh, what we can say about them is this, that they're all uh, destructive with evil uh, motivations. We can say that they seem to be getting progressively worse. The fourth beast is clearly far worse than the first three. Uh, we can say there's a strong parallel between chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's statue that he sees, and these beasts. And historically speaking, historically speaking, it seems likely uh, that these uh, beasts are speaking of, much like the statue, the secular anti-God kingdoms uh, of Daniel's day and the years that followed on. So the Babylonian, Persian, Greek, Roman empires that came uh, from Daniel's day onwards. But the question is this, is that it? Is that what that, that vision was all about? Was it just speaking of Daniel's day and perhaps the, the centuries, a few centuries that followed on from Daniel? Or does this vision tell us more than that? With the, the kind of apocalyptic style of writing that we find in the Bible, uh, in, here in Daniel and true of the text that we find in Revelation. Often it would be too simplistic to simply say uh, this means this. Uh, often in the, in the prophecy revealed uh, through this style of writing, there's various levels of fulfillment. Uh, it's not as simple as A equals B. Uh, there's a greater uh, depth to the fulfillment of these prophecies. And three levels that I just briefly want to mention that will help us uh, understand uh, the fulfillment of this prophecy, this vision uh, that Daniel sees. Uh, these are on the screen for us. So on one level, uh, we glimpse through these, this imagery and through these beasts and this, this kind of description. On one level, uh, we do indeed glimpse uh, what happened in Daniel's day and the years that followed. So they do indeed point to the anti-God kingdoms that rose up in Daniel's day and in the years that followed. So that's one level of fulfillment. It happened in Daniel's day and in the years that followed. Uh, secondly, and in a broader sense, the same vision and the same pictures point forward to the, the truth that throughout history, throughout human history, from Genesis 3 right through to the present day, throughout history, there has been uh, uh, tyrannical evil rulers who have risen up and sought the destruction of the people of God. This is very contemporary because we're just seeing one this very week, can't we? Rising up and seeking uh, with his anti-God agenda uh, to bring about his own 
uh, purpose uh, over in uh, the Ukraine. So th there's a sense in which this is true of all of history. There's always been tyrannical rulers. There's always been anti-God rulers who have risen up and sought uh, to stand against the one true God. But then finally, and in a kind of climax to this prophecy, there's future fulfillment too. So here we stand in 2022. There's a sense in which there's fulfillment yet to come. There's something in the future uh, that this speaks of, and particularly this fourth beast, the worst of them all that we'll come onto in a moment. Uh, let's just pause from beasts, because I don't know about you, but it's all getting a bit crazy with beasts, because Daniel's vision turns, actually, and Daniel stops looking at beasts, and in the vision he starts to see uh, something else, and we'll come back to, to the beasts in a minute. But the next section, verses 9 to 14, uh, we see the appearance of the Son of Man, the appearance of the Son of Man. Uh, I wonder if you've ever seen something so great that you've just really struggled to describe it. Maybe you've travelled uh, to a part of the world and you saw just this fantastic landscape or just something amazing and you've come back and you've tried to describe it, but you're quite conscious that your words don't really do justice to the... Uh, incredible thing that you've seen or maybe even you've taken a photo I've certainly experienced that and you show someone the photo and you think it, it doesn't really do it justice it doesn't quite capture how great uh, whatever it was that you've seen well I think there's a degree of that here with Daniel because Daniel uh, puts in words what he sees and his words are great but there's a sense in which that which he describes is so much greater uh, verse 9, he looks, Daniel, I read this at the beginning of the service, and he sees the throne room of God. How can you describe that in words? Well, Daniel tries, and he's fixated, Daniel, on this one particular uh, throne, and the throne is the one on which uh, the Ancient of Days took his seat. That is the Lord, the God, uh, our God on the throne, the Almighty. And Daniel sees this, he's glimpsing heaven. And we see in, in this next section here kind of a great contrast from the first section because in the first section, you'll remember these beasts and the chaos that they arose out of, pictured by the sea, this restless sea, this sea which depicted evil, and out of the, the sea came these beasts. Well, here, in these verses, in verses 9 to 14, as Daniel sees the throne room of God, we see order and beauty which surround the divine judge of all. As opposed to the chaos which surrounded the beasts, we see order and beauty. And Daniel does his best to describe this. You can see the verses there on the screen. Uh, his clothing was white like snow. The hair of his head was like the whitest wood. His throne was fl uh, flaming uh, with fire. Its wheels were ablaze. Uh, here is the Lord described in this kind of uh, descriptive uh, language, uh, the Lord, the judge of all. And Daniel goes to describe this awesome vision of the throne room of God. And it's made uh, abundantly clear that here is God, here is the Lord of all, here is the ancient of days, the judge of all. Verse 10, the court was seated and the books were opened for judgment. This is the one who truly sits on the throne. Although there is great unrest and evil in the world pictured by these beasts, and yet it's the Lord who is truly on the throne. And then something catches Daniel's eye as he's having this vision. He's seen the beasts, he sees the throne room of God, and then something else catches his eye. His attention's dragged away, as it were, from the throne. And back towards the beast, verse 11, then I continue to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. What happens to these beasts, this, these evil beasts that have risen up uh, out of the sea? Well, verse 11 is clear. The beast was slain, its body destroyed and thrown into the fire, this fourth beast, this beast of power, frightening, 
But before the Lord, it's brought low. It's ultimately destroyed. And then Daniel looks and he sees one like a son of man come in with the clouds of heaven. Here is the son of man, but not just a mere mortal. The clouds of heaven often referring to a deity in ancient times. Here is the son of man. Yes, a man, but not uh, merely uh, mortal. And where the evil beasts sought power for themselves and sought to destroy, they themselves will be destroyed, is what we're told here. Their power was limited and their kingdoms will fall. The Son of Man, in contrast, uh, we're told, will reign forever. We just sang it, didn't we, just a few moments ago, that he is king forever. Kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall. He is faithful through it all. Verse 14, he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Well, as Laura uh, rightly told us earlier, and we'll be familiar as Christians who know our New Testament, uh, we ask the question, who is the Son of Man? And we instantly know the answer to that because it's the title that Jesus gives to himself time and time again in the New Testament. Jesus is the true man. The beast was a a kind of disturbing man beast. That's what Daniel sees. But Jesus is the true man, the one whose kingdom will never pass away. How will Jesus, the son of man, win the victory over these beasts which depict everything which stands opposed to God. How will he win the victory, the Son of Man? Mark 10, verse 45 on the screen. For even the Son of Man, this is Jesus speaking of himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. For the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus himself gave his life as a ransom for many. God, the uncreated one, became one of us, didn't he? He stepped down to this very earth in order that he might bear the weight of sin and everything that stands opposed to the rule of God, that he might redeem us uh, from the destruction which has come in the way of everyone who stands in line with these beasts pictured in Daniel 7, all that stand in opposition to the rule of God and God's perfect kingdom. Jesus, the Son of Man, the suffering servant, the forever reigning King. That's the big picture uh, of Daniel as an entire book and the picture uh, for us that we see here in Daniel 7. We live Uh, in a world, don't we, we know from experience, we live in a world where there are indeed powers that oppose the rule of God, powers with evil agendas, anti-God agendas rising up. We could feel, uh, as Laura helpfully put earlier in the Bible, that we're on the losing team because sometimes we feel like we're the minority and, and in some ways that would be true. We are perhaps at times in the minority. And we do indeed live in a hostile world. And there is indeed opposition to the rule of God, powerful opposition to the rule of God. But Daniel 7 tells us to fear not. Fear not, because ultimately Jesus wins. That was the big picture for Daniel. And the same is true for us today, that the Lord reigns, that he wins. And whatever opposition may come against God and his rule, it is merely for a season Uh, The Lord wins. He rules. And with that in mind, the truth that the Lord ultimately wins, as I said last week, I think I quoted Corrie ten Boom, who speaks about, read the last pages of the Bible. We know how the story ends. Jesus wins. We know that. And with that in mind, this vision in Daniel 7 turns back to this powerful fourth beast. Verses 15 to 28, the destruction of the beast. Uh, Verse 15 tells us 
uh, that Daniel is troubled by this vision, uh, and understandably, it's uh, quite a vision. Uh, Verse 16 goes on to remind uh, Daniel of what he's just seen, that God is king. He's the one on the throne. And despite the disturbing nature of these beasts, it's God who is firmly seated on the throne. And then Daniel turns his attention again specifically to this fourth beast in verse 19. Then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, says Daniel, which was different from all the others and most terrifying With its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. Well, as we said earlier, these four beasts that are described picture uh, the coming secular kingdoms, the anti-God kingdoms that would rise up. And this fourth one may well represent the Roman Empire. But in this prophecy here in Daniel 7... Uh, We read in Scripture for the first time uh, what is later referred to as the Antichrist, a prophecy of an anti-God figure that will rise up in the last days, an end-time figure. Rome may have been Antichrist at times, and for sure, and there's been many Antichrist figures throughout history, but this fourth beast speaks of the Antichrist who will appear before the second coming of the Lord Jesus. We live in the last days. The Lord Jesus is coming back, um, but there will be a figure who stands opposed to the Lord uh, in a powerful way. Paul speaks of him. So this is not just something we find in this, uh, uh, I don't mean this in a disrespectful sense, but this kind of crazy apocalyptic style of writing. And we find it in Paul's letters to Thessalonians. Uh, Paul uh, speaks of this antichrist figure on the screen concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. We ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Paul speaks of this man of lawlessness, the same uh, that we read of here in Daniel 7, pictured by this fourth beast, an anti God uh, figure. And Revelation 13 similarly uh, speaks of uh, this beast that we're reading of in Daniel 7. Again, you'll see this on the screen, Revelation 13. Uh, Here's John who's having a vision. He says, I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard that had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast. Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. Here again is this same figure that we see in Daniel 7 that Paul speaks of in 2 Thessalonians and John sees in Revelation 13, this antichrist figure who will rise up against the Lord, against his uh, rule and against his people. And in Daniel 7, Uh, We see uh, a little bit more in verses 23 to 25. We see, uh, you'll see on the screen, uh, some of the characteristics of uh, this uh, uh, character pictured by the beast. Blasphemy, the persecution of the Lord's people. Uh, The word in uh, verse 25, which uh, probably reads oppress in your translation, has this meaning of kind of wearing out a garment. So this beast, this being will oppress and persecute the people of God uh, to the point of wearing down uh, the people of God. Uh, there'll be, a, 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 or at least this uh, being will seek to bring in a new table of religious festivals and a new morality. 
Now, there's a sense in which we see glimpses of this even in our day, isn't it? A new morality. You know, our morality has been completely undermined uh, once based upon the Bible uh, and now no more in our land. It has completely been undermined. We have a new morality introduced in our day. Uh, what is right and wrong is no longer uh, defined by scripture, uh, but defined by who knows what, just whatever's popular or whoever happens to be uh, in authority. Well, we know uh, that we are uh, in the last days, that the Lord is coming back. It's been the last days ever since the Lord Jesus died, rose again and ascended back to be with the Father from that point up to today. Uh, we're in the last days. These are what the Bible calls the last days. And the Lord is coming back. Now, when he's coming back, uh, I don't know and you don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us. But the Lord is coming back because that's what the Bible does uh, tell us. And when he does come back, uh, he'll return victorious. He'll come back victorious. Verse 25 uh, goes on to tell us that this end time kind of havoc, which will be uh, kind of uh, brought about by this Antichrist figure, will intensify and last for a period uh, of three and a half years, which is expressed poetically in verse 25. But the conclusion is this, that whilst there has been uh, anti-God and there is anti-God, anti-Christ figures throughout the entirety of history, and there will be uh, an anti-Christ figure who rises up at the end, the conclusion is this, that judgment is surely coming. And that's what we read in Daniel 7. Uh, the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. In other words, God the judge, the one who Daniel sees in Daniel 7, who's seated on the throne, the Ancient of Days, that he will defeat everything that stands opposed to the purposes of God. And the chapter ends by telling us of Daniel's state of shock uh, at this vision. Although the Lord wins, he's seen some incredible things and he turns pale. And one commentator puts it like this, you'll see on the screen. Daniel's perplexity might be explained like this. I know a great and wonderful and eternal kingdom is on the way. But there is a long and hard road of suffering before it arrives. Battles will be lost, but the war will be won when the Son of Man comes. Well, as I said at the start, we could spend a long time unpacking Daniel 7, and we don't have the time uh, to do that uh, now. Uh, it is uh, full of great truth, and we could uh, discuss it for a long time. But the reality is in Daniel 7, as we've seen throughout Daniel, that we live in a hostile world. That was true of Daniel's day. And Daniel's day is not really that much different from our day. Of course, there's been changes. But ultimately, Daniel lived in a hostile world. We live, too, in a hostile world. Uh, three quick things in summary as we wrap up this morning. Uh, we live in an anti-God world, uh, but we're not to be scared. We live in an anti-God world world but we're not to be scared scripture is quite clear there will be uh, an antichrist figure who comes before jesus returns there's been antichrist figures throughout all generations who have risen up we live today in an anti-christ culture a culture which stands opposed to the lord to his word uh, we have antichrist agendas all around us you'll find that in school uh, when you go to school, you'll find that in the workplace. Uh, you'll find that in the media, and you'll find that manifest in world leaders. We shouldn't be surprised, sadly, when uh, things happen like have happened this week. Because, of course, there will be anti-God rulers who rise up in these days. We're not to be surprised. It's been prophesied. The Lord's told us about it uh, in his word. But we're to be encouraged that the Lord is still coming and he is still the judge and he is still firmly on the throne and therefore we need not be scared. Jesus is victor. 
1 John 2, 18. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, and this is how we know it is the last hour. In other words, we're in the last days. The Lord is coming back, and he is the victor. We need not be scared. Secondly, the struggle's real, and therefore we're to be prepared. Daniel saw that struggle, didn't he, depicted by these beasts that represented everything opposed to the Lord. It was a real struggle for Daniel in his day in Babylon, in that hostile world. It's been a struggle for every disciple of the Lord ever since. In Jesus' day, for the first disciples, was it easy? No, of course it wasn't. They too lived in a hostile world, and it's been true throughout church history, and it's true for us, and it will be true Uh, for the time to come too. We live uh, in a hostile world and the struggle is real and therefore we're to be prepared. Our struggle's not against flesh and blood, uh, Paul tells the Ephesians. We're not struggling against our fellow man but against ultimately Satan and the dark spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's what Paul tells the Ephesians, uh, and therefore we're to be prepared. In the hostile world in which we live, we're to be prepared. How, how are we to be prepared? Well, Paul goes on to tell the Ephesians in chapter 6 and on the screen, therefore put on the full armour of God. Put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything to stand, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted, with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We're to stand with the word of God, the sword of the Spirit, the word of God, the truth of the gospel, and we are to look to the Lord through prayer. The struggle's real, but we can be prepared. And finally, the Lord is coming. Uh, Be expectant. The Lord is coming. Uh, Be expectant. I don't know how you feel uh, uh, when we reflect on some of this, but it would be easy to become a little downcast because we reflect on the reality that we do live in an anti-God world, And uh, therefore, we can kind of feel a bit downcast that actually there is uh, many a force that rises up against God, and we feel downcast, but we're not to be downcast. Our eyes are to be lifted uh, to the Lord. The Lord uh, would want to fill us with hope and joy, though we live in a hostile world, and though there is opposition to the Lord and to his purposes, uh, we uh, can know uh, the hope that ultimately the Lord is king and we're to be expectant of his coming what a day of rejoicing that will be when the lord comes we'll no longer be saying this is a hostile world we'll no longer uh, be uh, saying this is not our home Uh, we'll no longer uh, have to deal with uh, antichrist figures antichrist governments because the lord will come and reign what a day that will be and we as the people of god Uh, will enter into the presence of the Lord with singing and everlasting joy will crown our heads, says the Bible. Let's live with expectation and joy and a continual remembrance that the Lord is king. Uh, He is the victor. He is the Lord. We live in an anti-God world. Don't be scared. The struggle's real. Be prepared. But the Lord is coming And therefore we can be expectant and joyful that he ultimately has won the victory. And he'll be coming back, not in weakness as he came the first time, to take on a cross and to pay for sin. But he'll be coming back to reign and every knee will bow and confess that he is God. Let me finish with the words of Spurgeon. Spurgeon said this, As surely as he, Jesus, overcame and triumphed once for you, so surely you that love his name shall triumph in him too. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for... uh